Hi everyone, today we will be talking about columnar design, but first let's do a quick reminder about page sizes, composition, and scales. Let's first review page sizes and proportions. Remember that your rectangle can have an inherent grid and by working within this grid we can keep things in proportion. For example, A sizes that naturally divide into proportional rectangles when you continue to divide by 2. Perhaps a hierarchy of the type can also go in multiples of 2. You can also think about rectangles subdivided with a golden section. The model's form can act as the places you can place your text and images, keeping elements in proportion with a golden section. When creating a layout, you want to keep proportions in mind. You want to make sure the margins, the main text area, the secondary text areas, and even the gutters are all in proportion to each other. This is especially important in layout as it forms a structure, the skeleton of your layout. Here's a good example of how we can approach a page layout using the Fibonacci sequence which leads to the golden ratio and section. So, just a reminder of, of the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the two previous numbers equaling the next number. So, 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, then we get 13, 21, then 34. When you divide the last two numbers, you begin to approach the golden ratio. So, 5 divided by 3 is 1.666, 8 divided by 5 is 1.6, 13 divided by 8 is 1.625, 21 divided by 13 is 1.6153, and so on and so on until you get something getting closer to the golden ratio, which is 1.618033, and so on and so on. So we can use the numbers in the Fibonacci sequence to construct our grid. In this example, the page is 21 by 34 units. The inner margin is 3, the outer margin is 5, the footer margin is 8, the text block's width is 13, and the text block height is 21. You can also see how the Fibonacci sequence is applied here. The modular pica sticks slide rule is divided using the Fibonacci sequence, and the layouts above are designed with the slide ruler. You can also use systems like Le Corbusier's modular scale where the horizontal and vertical axes both scale by the golden ratio, creating a variety of rectangles. Think about how you can reflect this proportion into the typographic hierarchy. All right, let's start talking about columnar design. For most publications, a columnar grid is used. This layout is an effective way of organizing large amounts of information while also allowing for flexibility. Ellen Lupton says, while single column grids work well for simple documents, multi-column grids provide flexible formats for publications that have a complex hierarchy or that integrate text and illustrations. The more columns you create, the more flexible your grid becomes. You can use the grid to articulate the hierarchy of the publication by creating zones for different kinds of content. A text or image can occupy a single column or can span several. Not all the space has to be filled. Generally, a columnar layout uses columns of equal width. This gives an ordered and systematic approach to page layout. It is good to keep in mind that the number of columns can change the tone of the page. An even number of uniform columns creates a more balanced and stable tone, as the page can be divided into halves, while odd columns have more dynamism. A 6 or 12 column grid can provide the best of both worlds, but the page size needs to be large enough to accommodate. However, not all columns have to be of the same width, and different size columns can be more dynamic. This works best if you only have two or three columns. Generally, we have the main column and then a secondary column, say, for captions. Sometimes you can add a different size column if it holds information separate from the main content. Like in this example of a German newspaper, the leftmost column is slightly thicker and holds a table of contents, market information, online promotion, and other information. All right, let's start looking at designing spreads. When designing layouts for prints and books, we design as spreads and we look at the left page and right page as one unit. Both pages share the same exact structure, so on each page, the text columns are the same width and height, the gutters are the same width, and the header and footer margins are the same height. However, there, there are two considerations when making a spread. You can make a symmetrical spread, where the margins, top, bottom, inner, and outer, are the same creating a mirror image on each page. The left page, verso, and the right page, recto, are mirror images of each other. Symmetrical spreads are stable, balanced, and cohesive, and suit more formal purposes. Asymmetrical spreads are where the two pages are the same. 
the inner margin becomes the outer margin and vice versa. Often, asymmetrical pages can feel more dynamic and the layout draws the reader's eye to the next page, giving a sort of horizontal momentum. Asymmetrical spreads are a bit more unorthodox and give a contemporary and very dynamic feeling. Our goal in making refined layout structure is to consider all the elements and have them all in proportion. Here are the variables you can consider when you're designing your page and your grid system. You can first consider the page size and its proportion. Then you can consider the text block size and its proportion. You can consider the width of sec any secondary or tertiary columns. And you can also consider the margin widths and heights as well as the gutter widths. Let's take a look at an example. In this example, we can see the page proportion is 1 to root 2, so 1 to 4.14. The text block inside is a double square, so 2 to 1. The inner margin is equal to the top margin, which is the ninth of the page's height. The footer margin is twice the height of the header margin, which also means it's related to the page size. The outer margin is a third of the page's width, the large width being very deliberate so that the reader could add their own notes. Remember, when we design, we want to relate everything to each other in terms of proportions rather than just having clean numbers. For example, perhaps you have a column that is 5.32 inches. You would probably want to make that 5.5 or 5.25 inches instead. However, remember that proportions, which link the space together, are more important than having clean numbers. As Bringhurst says, as a general rule, it is better to make incremental jumps in the text block first and to readjust the margins thereafter paying more attention in the latter case to absolute proportion than to convenient units of measurement. A way to get away from wanting clean and even numbers is to measure in smaller units, say points. Using finer measurements lessens the temptation to round to the nearest inch or pica. Margins are incredibly important to layout design regardless of whether it's digital, print, a website, or a book. As Robert Bringhurst states, perhaps 50% of the character integrity of a printed page lies in its letter forms. Much of the other 50% resides in its margins. In typography, margins must do three things. One, they must lock the text block to the page and lock the facing pages to each other through the force of their proportions. Second, they must frame the text block in a manner that suits its design. Third, they must protect the text block, leaving it easy for the reader to see and convenient to handle. That is, they must leave room for the reader's sums. The third of these is easy, and the second is not difficult. The first is like choosing type. It is an endless opportunity for typographic play and a serious test of skill. Finally, let's move on to discuss the Van de Graaff Canon. The Van de Graaff Canon is a historical reconstruction of how medieval and traditional layouts were formulated. The system is used generally for traditional book layout. It considers the book as an object to be held, which accounts for the large bottom and outer margins, where the thumbs would be, so as not to obstruct the type. The wide outer margins were also a consideration for side notes to be added by the reader. So let's look into constructing the Van der Graaff Canon. The construction of the Van der Graaff Canon is based on striking diagonals over a spread, page, and intersecting points. First, we divide the spread in half. Then we strike diagonals across that spread. Next, we strike diagonals across the page. Think of this as a way to tie the page to the spread. From the intersection of the spread and the page diagonal, draw a line straight up to the page's height. The intersection point is where the page and spread come together. From that point, draw another line to the other intersection point on the other page. By doing so, this ties the two facing pages together, which are also tied to the spread. This creates another intersection point above the initial intersection. Now we draw our text block. From the second higher intersection point, we draw a rectangle that reaches the spread's diagonal line, and then we bring that rectangle down to meet the page's diagonal line. We will measure the Van der Graaff Canon in an in-class exercise. Take a second to reflect on how are the text block's width and height related to the page's width and height? What is the height of the footer and header margins and how are they related to the page size? What about the text block? What is the inner and outer margin and how are they related to the page size as well as the text block? Looking at the intersecting points, margins, text block size, and placement, how many grid cells are there on each page? We will try to place this into InDesign using Create Guides to figure it out. 
For another in-class activity, we'll also look at how we can create a page or spread proportion using geometric shapes. We'll see if we can use those shapes and intersections to derive a columnar layout grid. Take a look at these examples from Robert Bringers and see if anything inspires you. All right, that ends today's lecture on columnar layout. Thanks for watching, and let me know if you have any questions or if you would like any of these ideas elaborated on. See you in class.